Siemens. Dr. Sherex Siemens has been working with human embryonic stem cells for 20 years with an emphasis on the generation of central and peripheral neurons. She studied biology and received her PhD in the field of neuroscience from the University of Basel. During her first postdoc at Stanford University, she worked with, with adult stem cells and during her second postdoc in Berlin, she started to focus on the development of differentiation procedures to generate sensory neurons. Currently, Katrin is located at the Institute of Pharmacology at Heidelberg University and is a co-PI in the Heidelberg Pain Consortium. Her main interest is the development of an in vitro model system using human pluripotent stem cell derived nociceptors and glutamatergic neurons as a novel tool to investigate synaptic transmission in models of sensitization or pain related mutations. Dr. Strange Siemens, you can start whenever you are, you are ready. Okay. Well, hello from Heidelberg. And Thanks very much for inviting me to be part of this symposium. So as you already mentioned, I will talk about human stem cell derived neurons today. So we switch gears from a complete organism such as the naked mole rat now coming to a more um, <clears throat> primitive or reduced system by just looking at specific cell types in a dish. So, um, let's see, sorry. The reason to start all of this was that for the last couple of decades, the rodent model system has been at the center of patent research. And as also Ewan just pointed out, um, why not? I mean, also the naked mole rat, why not looking at these species also if they are not a human organism um, to find out certain fundamental aspects of, in this case, sensitization or pain pathways. And so it's absolutely um, for good reasons that rodent model systems have been at the center of pain research for these last decades. And we have learned a lot by using them. But in the last couple of years, it became obvious that there are more and more difficulties in translating results from preclinical studies, studies done in rodent model systems to the clinics. So when it comes to kind of translate the data into the human organism in, in order to find new um, therapies um, in the pain um, field, there was this huge discrepancy between um, the preclinical trials and the clinical trials. And so there is now, I would say, a kind of a new, um, maybe kind of generation of, of um, re, um, how would you say, of, of model systems that are on the way to be generated that have a more translational character where you try to find systems that bring together the human organism as well as um, what's known from the rodent model systems. So something that you would call maybe a translational model system. And in this terms here now between um, the mouse and the human, we were thinking about working maybe with human neurons. So in the field of, of pain research, the question would be what kind of human, human neurons would that be? So if you look at this scheme here, um, it depicts how we would normally detect a painful stimulus. So um, there is in the environment, there's something painful that you um, encounter. And then you have these very specialized cells that um, you and already mentioned before, the nociceptors, which are sensory neurons, so belonging to the peripheral nervous system. And these nociceptors, they are equipped to um, detect these painful stimuli and they transduce those stimuli and transmit the information via the dorsal root ganglia into the spinal cord. At this um, level of the spinal cord, the information is passed on to the next order of neurons and these neurons then belong to the central nervous system. And the information is then traveling up until the brain where the perception of the pain is generated. 
So now again to my initial question, what kind of human neurons would we like to use for this translational model system? It should be sensory neurons. Now it's not easy to access human sensory neurons because these neurons, they have their cell bodies reside in the dorsal root ganglia. The dorsal root ganglia are nicely protected um, in the vertebra, so it's not easy to access them, and especially not in a living organism. But even from um, a dead person, to receive DRGs post-mortem is also rather difficult. So what could be the solution to the problem? Well, it could be pluripotent stem cells. Now, pluripotent stem cells, they have, um, and this could be either human embryonic stem cells or human induced pluripotent stem cells generated according to the protocol from Takahashi and Yamanaka. So the pluripotent stem cells have this great advantage that is depicted in this cartoon, which is my most favorite stem cell cartoon. These cells can be anything you want them to be, in theory, for sure. And in the laboratory and environment, this is not as trivial because you have to know what they need to become anything. But in theory, these cells have two really nice main characteristics that makes them a really good tool to work with. For once, they have the ability for self-renewal, which means they can theoretically produce unlimited amounts of undifferentiated stem cells, which means that you have unlimited source if you ever get hold of one, of, of one vial of a pluripotent stem cell line, and for sure if you know how to treat them correctly. And the second characteristic is that they have the ability to differentiate into cells of all three germ layers. So they are pluripotent and they can give rise to endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. So working now with the pluripotent stem cells and generating human um, neurons out of them, for sure only works if you have good protocols to generate these cells. And back when I started the whole differentiation business to generate sensory neurons in 2010, there was hardly anything published along that lines. So there were a lot of protocols published how you could generate neurons from the central nervous system lineages, but not from the peripheral nervous system. And so um, I had to start or I decided to generate my own protocols to be able to differentiate sensory neurons. And the way I did it was that I decided to recapitulate a little bit what is known from the in vivo development of the sensory nervous system. And in the, during the development of sensory neurons, you first have the generation of the progenitors, which are called the neurocrest cells. And so this is the way um, I did it, I first generated neurocrest cells, and I will get into that a little bit more in detail um, in a minute. And then I used two different approaches. Um, one was to use some growth factors on the neurocrest cells, and the other one to induce um, a transient expression of a transcription factor. And I ended up in the end with two different types of sensory neurons. There are other ways how you can generate these sensory neurons in the dish. So in the meantime, um, there was a little kind of an explosion in the field. So there are a variety of different protocols now out there. And one of the first ones was <clears throat> from the group of Lawrence Studer and he used small molecule inhibitors that he added to a culture of um, embryonic stem cells and ended also with nociceptor-like cells. And then there is another completely different approach where there was um, where there are researchers that showed that you can even trans um, uh, trans differentiate um, fibroblasts. So you yet you just take human fibroblasts and then either you transiently express certain transcription factors and end up with sensory-like neurons, or you constantly express 
um, a variety of transcription factors, and then you also end up with nociceptor-like cells. So, which means there are now, and in the meantime, there are even more protocols available. It's always a little bit the question, how efficient are these protocols? A lot of them end up with a more heterogeneous population of cells that are not only comprising um, sensory-like neurons, but also other cell types, which then, depending on what kind of questions you would like to look into, makes it a little bit difficult to work with. So, as I mentioned before, and I want to now go a little bit more into detail how I generate my sensory-like neurons, I decided to recapitulate a little bit what's known from the in vivo development. And as I mentioned before already, the in vivo development of the sensory nervous system starts with the generation of the neurocrest cells. So you have, during development, you have the neural tube um, formation. And when the neural tube closes at its dorsal part, there is a specific cell population that delaminates and these cells have the ability to migrate. And these cells are neurocrest cells. It's a very interesting cell population per se. These cells are also um, sort of a stem cell. They are multipotent because they can give rise to different cell types of the ectodermal and mesodermal lineage. And one of the cell types they give rise to are the sensory neurons. So this was my, my starting point. I decided I will try to um, generate the in vivo progenitors of the sensory neurons first and try to differentiate those further into sensory neurons. So how would I do that? I was pretty lucky at the time because a former colleague from mine from Stanford, Ruchi Bajpai, she had developed a very elegant method how to generate these neurocrest like cells. So you start with a normal culture of pluripotent stem cells. In my case, I mostly work with human embryonic stem cells. And you let these cells grow to confluency and then you plate them on a non-adhesive substrate. And on this non-adhesive substrate, the cells start to form floating spheres. And we call them neuroectodermal spheres because they are kept in a medium that supports the development in towards the neuroectodermal lineage. And after a couple of days, what you can observe is that there is some spontaneous attachment of these spheres onto um, the surface of the dish, as you can see here. So this red asterisk depicts one of those spheres that has attached to the surface. And then you can observe cells migrating out of it. So for sure, you can't see the migration yourself. So we did a time-lapse moving at one point. And here you should now appreciate the cells kind of migrating out of this um, sphere. So this very bright structure here is the edge of one of those spheres that attach to the surface. And then here the neurocrest like cells migrate out. And you end up in the end with this very distinct population of cells that migrated out. Ideally, you, you really get a gap. Um, if you wait too long, then the rest of the sphere will also flatten out. And then sometimes it becomes a little bit difficult to separate the cells from each other. But normally you get a really nice and distinct ring of these neurocrest cells. And those ones you can then harvest. And if you replate them, you can see that they have a very homogeneous uh, morphology. We characterize the cells looking at marker expression, and they do express markers that are typical found in neurocrest cells. So the beauty of the system is also you can freeze these cells and um, thaw them whenever you want to start a differentiation, which helps also to kind of um, save time, which is also an issue working with these differentiation procedures because they can take quite a long time. So having now my starting population, my starting material, I first tried to differentiate these crest cells into sensory neurons just by using some goodies. 
So I put um, growth factors into the differentiation media, such as BDNF, GDNF, NGF, or NT3, knowing that sensory neurons um, express the typical receptors for these growth factors, and I also added retinoic acid. And I ended up with um, a population of cells that looked like neurons that were rather large, um, and these cells were low threshold mechanoreceptor-like cells. So how did we know that these cells were mechanoreceptor-like cells? Well, we did for sure a lot of different characterizations. So we did immunocytochemistry, as you can see here in this staining, the cells express NF200 and MAF-A, MAF-A being a transcription factor known to be present in mechanoreceptors, and NF200, a neurofilament um, that, at least in the mouse, is only found in mechanoreceptors. So we did, as I said, immunocytochemistry, but we also did deep sequencing. We looked at the um, whole um, sequence um, profile, RNA profile of these cells, and we could find a lot of markers that are known to be present in mechanoreceptors. But we also wanted to know if these cells are functional. So the first thing we did, even before we did a lot of the uh, marker analysis, was um, calcium imaging, because calcium imaging is something that is done rather fast. And the beauty of this method is that there are a lot of agonists um, that can be used um, that give you a good hint what kind of sensory neuron you could have generated if it is a sensory neuron. Because um, sensory neurons express um, different trip channels, or at least some of the sensory neurons do express um, different trip channels. And Ewan already mentioned trip V1. So you can, in a calcium imaging experiment, you can add capsaicin. And if the cells express trip V1, you would get a change in the calcium concentrations, which you could pick up then. Um, you can use mustard oil, which is the agonist of trip A1, or you can use menthol, which is the agonist of trip M8. So before we knew that these cells were mechanoreceptors, we did calcium imaging and we used all of these agonists and the cells did not respond to any of them. So which told us it's not a classical nociceptor or cold sensing cell. So, but what else could it be? So we did some electrophysiology and one of the most salient characteristics of a mechanoreceptor is its ability to respond to a mechanical stimulus with an electrical current. And you can do this nicely in the dish. Um, what you can see here is a mechanoreceptor. In this case, it's a mouse mechanoreceptor. And then you have here a class electrode that is driven by a nanomotor onto the membrane of this mechanoreceptor and thereby deflecting the membrane. And here um, on the right side, you have an electrode from which you use to record from the cell. So a mechanoreceptive cell would respond to the intendation of the membrane with an electrical current. And this is exactly what we found. So depending on how um, large the intendation of the membrane was, um, we got a different uh, strong in what current um, of the cells. And maybe just as a side note, when we found that our cells that I generated are mechanoreceptors, um, it was just about the time where Adam Padapudian for the first time described um, the piezo family. So it was always a long-standing question, what kind of channel is responsible for these um, mechanical currents? And so he had just um, published piezo one and piezo two as potential candidates, but it was not yet completely clear if they, would, if they are really responsible for um, the mechanical currents in the mechanoreceptors. So at the time we decided, now that we have this really nice cellular model, we would generate 
um, a stem cell line where we knock out PSO2 and have a look what happens without PSO2 being present in the differentiated mechanoreceptors. And we could see that in the absence of PSO2, the mechanical currents are gone. Um, so this was a nice coincidence because we were able to show this in this in vitro model system um, at almost the exactly same time as Adam then showed it in the mouse. And as you know, um, this year's Nobel Prize did not only go to David Julius for finding TRIPD1, but also for, um, to Adam Padapudian for finding PDSO2. Okay, back to the generation of the sensory neurons. So I showed you, I was able just with the mix of growth factors to generate these mechanoreceptor-like cells. But I was a little bit disappointed at the time because I couldn't see any other sensory, sensory neuronal cell types in these differentiations. And I was rather hoping for being able to generate nociceptive cells. So I um, decided to change the strategy and I went back into the in vivo development of the sensory nervous system and I looked um, what other transcription factors maybe are known to be important at early time points of development of the sensory nervous system. And one transcription factor that um, came to mind is the NGN1, the neurogenin 1, which is expressed very early on during the mouse development um, when the sensory neurons are generated. So what I did was that um, I generated lentivirus that harbors an inducible neurogenin 1 um, plasmid so that by adding doxycycline, I can switch the neurogenin expression on and off. In addition, I also added some of the growth factors. Um, so you can see here BDNF, GDNF, and NGF. And I ended up with nociceptor-like cells. Again, how did we know that these are nociceptor-like cells? Um, we also did immunostatochemistry, um, which was a little bit more difficult in this case because there are not so many good antibodies that work in or on human tissue. Um, the ones that I've stained, these ones with ILAT1 and NF200 are actually not really specific nociceptor and nociceptor markers. Um, ILAT1 is a very general sensory marker. It's also a transcription factor. And the NF200, I told you before that in the mouse, at least it was known or it is known to be very specifically only expressed by mechanoreceptors. This is different in the human organism there you find it in almost all sensory neurons. So the characterization of these cells by immunocytochemistry was not very helpful, but we did also deep sequencing, which showed us for sure that there were some nociceptive specific markers expressed, but the most um, yeah, revealing experiment in this case was the calcium imaging, because here we could see that the cells respond to the addition of capsaicin, which means that they do express TRIPD1. We also did look at the um, ability of these cells to respond to mechanical stimulation, which they also do um, in a very strong way, actually. And this is nothing unusual because no receptors, um, you have a huge variety of different subtypes of nociceptors, but some of them also respond to mechanical stimulation. And these cells are then called also polymodal cells. So we were able um, to yeah, set up differentiation procedures to either generate uh, mechanoreceptors or nociceptor-like cells from human stem cells. Now, how could you use these cells in pain research? So the low threshold mechanoreceptors are maybe not such a good um, tool to use in pain research because these cells actually don't transmit pain. Um, low threshold mechanoreceptors are 
important for us um, for touch sensation, vibration, to discriminate different textures, things like that, but they are not involved um, in pain perception. So for sure, we have now the nociceptor-like cells that we could use um, to do pain-related research. So what could you do with these cells? You could look at certain aspects of sensitization um, from the calcium imaging experiments. I know these cells do express TRPV1. So TRPV1 is the receptor that does detect painful stimuli. So you could use these cells to look at different aspects of sensitization. What you could also do is you could um, generate iPSC, so induced pluripotent stem cells from patients that suffer from specific pain phenotypes. And in this context, I want to um, make a little link to one paper if you are interested. This was published by Barbara Nama and Angelika Lampert, where they did exactly that. They had a pain patient, um, a pain not based on a genetic alteration, um, and they decided to generate induced pluripotent stem cells from this patient and differentiate them into sensory neurons using a different protocol than the one that I developed. And they could see that these um, sensory neurons that they generated were much more active compared to control uh, counterparts. And then they played around with certain substances. And in the end, they were able to find a therapy for this pain patient to uh, minimize the pain. So a very nice um, example, how personalized medicine can work and how these um, patient-derived iPSCs and differentiated sensory neurons from this patient could help to um, yeah, find a specific therapy for this patient. What you also could do, and I think this is um, also where these cells will become more and more important also in the future, is that you use them to try to recapitulate findings from rodent model systems on the level of the nociceptors. Um, because we also know, and I haven't mentioned that before, that one reason why there is this discrepancy between translating preclinical findings into the clinics could also be due to the fact that we do have species um, specific differences, um, which becomes more and more obvious um, as more and more people now also try to work with human sensory neurons, that their expression profile of specific markers that are, for example, also involved in um, pain pathways differ between um, the mouse organism and the human organism. And therefore, you could use now these in vitro generated human nociceptors to maybe figure out if some of, of those findings that you have in the rodent model system, if they really hold true in a human neuron. So as mentioned before, I'm part of a pain consortium here in Heidelberg. And together with my um, collaboration partner, um, Claudio Acuna, we decided that we don't want to just work on one cell type. We decided we would like to go a step further and try to focus on the next um, station of kind of um, information uh, on the next relay station where the nociceptors uh, transmit the information about the painful stimuli onto neurons of the central nervous system. So we try, we decided we want to focus a little bit on um, the synaptic transmission between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. And how are we going to do that? So we decided to develop a co-culture system where we use um, the sensory neurons, the nociceptive like cells that I just showed you how I can generate them, um, that we call the inoces because it's an induced system that we use to generate these cells and combine those with clodomatergic neurons that are also generated from human pluripotent stem cells and that do resemble central nervous system neurons. 
and these cells are uh, called the eyeglots. And our idea was to put those cell types together and look at synaptic transmission and specifically how is synaptic transmission altered under um, states of sensitization or in pain related circumstances. For example, if there are specific mutations um, that lead to pain phenotypes. So Claudio comes from a lab where um, they developed a protocol how to generate these clodomatergic neurons. Um, it's basically the same principle as I do it with my nociceptors. And to be honest, um, I kind of stole the idea from them. So what they did was that they used a lentivirus harboring an um, plasmid, an expression plasmid for the neurogenin 2. It's also an inducible system. So again, after infecting the cells, you can, by adding doxycycline, induce the expression of the neurogenin 2. And then by leaving the dox out, you can stop it again. And in this case, um, the human embryonic stem cells or blue reporting stem cells um, will be infected with a lentivirus. And then they differentiate into these clodomatergic like neurons. And the way we designed now our co-culture system is that we just generate the inoses and the iclutes. They are generated separately from each other. They are differentiated each for four to five days. And in this time, you can manipulate the cells individually. For example, you can um, introduce channel rhodopsin only into the inoceptors or GCAMP if you want to do um, calcium imaging only in the iglots. And then after four to five days, you toss the cells together. And then we wanted to look um, at the uh, synaptic transmission in these co-cultures. Before we started that, we wanted to see first what kind of electrical properties do the inoses have um, if they are separated and we would introduce channel rhodopsin because the channel rhodopsin would become a very important tool later in the co-culture because if we want to look at the synaptic transmission from the nociceptors onto the iglutes, we have to be able in the co-culture to only activate the nociceptors and then to um, record from the iglutes and we have to be able to separate them from each other. And we decided to do this with channel rhodopsin because this is the easiest. You would only have the channel rhodopsin in the inoses, and then you look for cells that are channel rhodopsin negative. In this case, the channel rhodopsin also harbors a reporter. And then you could record from the negative cells and activate only the presynaptic cells. But before coming to that, we wanted to see how would um, channel rhodopsin behave in the nociceptors. So we did some very basic electrophysiology. We looked at the um, triggering of action potentials in the nociceptors by current injection compared to light pulse via the channel rhodopsin. And we could see that this is basically almost um, the same. Uh, we can also see this hump-like structure here that some researchers have described as being very specific for nociceptive like cells or nociceptors in general. And also looking at some other parameters such as the amplitude of the action potentials um, and the threshold and so on, there was no major differences either if we um, trigger the APs by current injection or a light pulse. Um, then we were also interested in the question if the inoses would start to form synapses with each other, because if we then have a co-culture, it would become a little bit difficult to figure out um, from where now the um, signal is coming. So what we did is that we had the inoses and one batch was infected with channel rhodopsin, the other one not, and then we mixed them together but in a ratio that we had much more of the inosis with the channel rhodopsin to have a higher probability that those channel rhodopsin positive nociceptors would form synapses on the negative ones that if we would record from the negative ones, um, we could also see synaptic um, transmission. 
but we could not see any synaptic transmission with these um, cultures, even um, when we increase the calcium concentration, which normally um, leads to a tremendous increase in the excitatory postsynaptical currents, um, there was nothing here, which means that the inoses don't form synapses with each other in culture, which is also a very interesting phenomenon that was picked up by collaborators that are interested in finding out what is triggering actually synapse formation. So the next question was, what would happen if we now toss the inoses together with the iCLUTs? And as I said before already, so we would infect the inoses with the channel rhodopsin, and then we would put the cells together again in the ratio that we have much more of the inoses compared to the iglutes. But the probability when we um, record from an iglut that this also has, um, yeah, the chance to to have a lot of synaptic um, input from the inoses. How does a co-culture look like? So here's a staining. You can see in this um, yellow greenish color, um, the nociceptors. Um, what is lightened up here is the channel rhodopsin, um, not the channel rhodopsin itself, but the, the virus harboring the channel rhodopsin um, contains a, a tomato reporter. So um, but thereby you can um, make the inoses visible. And then here in, in Mangenta, you can see the iGLUTs that are stained with MAP2, which is a microtubuli associated protein that you find in the dendrites of the clodomatergic neurons. And what you can see here in this co-culture is that we do have this different ratio. We have much more of the inociceptors compared to the iGLUTs. Here's a zoom onto one of those iGLUTs, again stained with the MAP2. But what you can see here as well is standing for the presynaptic marker synapsin. And the synapsin um, co localizes with the channel rhodopsin of the inoses. And you can see that this process from the inoses is in close um, distinction, it, it's uh, close to one of those iGLUTs. Um, and these synapsin positive dots are close to the iGLUTs, um, which tells you that there might be some synaptic contact between those two different neurons. And what happens now um, if we give a light pulse and um, at the same time record from a general adoption negative iGLUT, um, we actually see um, EPSCs, so which means this depicts the light pulse, and here this is the recording from the iGLUT, um, which means that the channel rhodopsin activation can um, trigger these fast glutamatergic currents in the iGLUTs, which means that the synaptic contacts are being established in these co cultures. This, is, um, this was very important for us to see because. Um, as I said before, the inoses did not form um, synapses with each other, so it was not so clear if they then would form synapses with the iGLUTs, but they did it. And um, for us, this was um, a very intriguing moment. And now we also tested what would happen if we would activate the inoses not with channel rhodopsin, but maybe with capsaicin because as I told you and showed you, those um, cells do express TRPV1. So what we did was, um, again, we had a co-culture, the inoses did um, harbor the channel rhodopsin. Um, and the first experiment that we did was that we recorded from the um, channel rhodopsin positive cells after puffing um, capsaicin um, very locally onto them. And what you can see here are these inward currents that are typically um, for capsaicin response of a nociceptor. There were also cells, there were also inoses that did not respond to the capsaicin, um, which I would say is not 
so weird because although most of the cells in the culture, most of the inoses do respond to um, capsaicin, you always have a few that don't do it. So what would now happen if you record from an iGLUT and you puff capsaicin onto the system? So first of all, we established what iGLUT is synaptically connected to an inoce, therefore the general rhodopsin. So we gave a light pulse and then looked for iGLUTs that would respond to that light pulse because of the activation of the inoses. And then we recorded from the same iGLUT after puffing again the capsaicin. And also here we could see that this local administration of the capsaicin um, onto the nociceptors would elicit the EPSCs in the iGLUTs. So not only the general rhodopsin can trigger it, but also um, the capsaicin. What we could also observe is that there are a few um, iGLUT cells that did respond, which are much larger in what current that kind of, yeah, let us think if maybe these iGLUTs, some of them at least might also express trp one This is a big um, debate in the field if trp one is also present in central nervous system neurons, and we will have a closer look at that. Yeah, so now that we established this cool culture system, the question was how, um, what, what, what do we wanna do now with those ones? So what um, we decided to do is that we want to look into changes in synaptic transmission um, in cells that do harbor a mutation that in human leads to a pain phenotype. And there are not so many known. I mean, Ewan already mentioned um, that you could have either mutations where you don't have nociceptors at all, or you have mutations in certain sodium channels, the so-called channelopathies. And the most um, well-known channelopathies are those ones that um, happening in the NAV 1.7. And as he also already mentioned, you can have loss of function or gain of function. So loss of function that these people don't um, can feel any pain anymore, which is devastating as he has also shown and explained. We decided to go for um, a gain of function mutation in the NAV 1.7 channel. And one mutation that is also already very well known. Um, it's a mutation that is responsible for a, a disease that's called inherited erythromelalgia. And this disease presents with these episodes of burning pain and a redness and heat in the extremities. It's actually a point mutation. There are several known that can lead to this pain um, phenotype. We picked one of those point mutations and we generated um, human embryonic stem cell lines that harbor this point mutation and at the same time also isogenic lines. So we decided not for patient derived material because of the variations in the genetic background. So therefore we started again with embryonic stem cells and introduced the point mutation and in the same screen also looked for isogenic lines that did not have later on this point mutation. These cells were then um, differentiated and then we looked um, or we did some basic characteristics um, even before we, we started the whole co-culture system. So we looked in um, the inoce cultures and in the iGLUT cultures and we just compared basic properties of these neurons um, in the presence or absence of this mutation. So the first thing was to look at the number of action potentials that these cells would elicit. And here you can see the control cells. Um, iGLUTs are normally producing much more action potentials after current injections, while inoces are rather timid. They don't um, fire a lot, even if you inject current. And for the iGLUTs, this also did not change in the mutated lines, which are two different clones uh, depicted here in these two colors. So there was no difference between the control and the mutated lines in the iGLUTs. But in the inoces, we could see that the mutation in this NAF 1.7 channel 
would elicit much more action potentials after current injection. We looked also at some other basic um, properties such as the amplitude of the action potentials or the real base and there was no difference in the iGLUTs alone um, control versus the mutated lines but in the inoses we could see that the real base was decreased. So what is the real base? I mean I'm not an electrophysiologist and maybe a lot of you might also know not known what this is. So a real base is the current you need to inject into a cell that it triggers action potentials. And obviously you need to inject much less current into these mutated inoses to trigger action potential. So these cells seem to be more trigger happy, so to say. So these first data indicate that we do have changes in the electrical properties of the inoses alone that do have this um, mutation. This is not entirely new because there's already a lot of data out there about the mutation of this 1.7 um, uh, mutation. And this was also the reason why we picked it because it's already very well characterized and we wanted to have it as a kind of a proof of principle um, that we can kind of recapitulate what's already known from the literature. But what is not yet known is how this mutation reflects in the synaptic transmission. So what impact does it have on synaptic transmission? And unfortunately, I also won't be able to tell you because we have not um, analyzed those data yet. Um, we are, this is really brand new experiments. So this is what's coming next. Um, before I finish, I wanted also to show you that so far we did these core cultures just by tossing the cells together but we would like to um, switch the system a little bit to use these microfluidic chambers. So we work together with Rutgers University in the States and they have developed this nice compartmentalized microfluid device where you have five different compartments that are separated from each other, but that are linked together by little micro channels. And this would give us the opportunity to separate the different cell types from each other, but the processes could kind of reach from one to the other compartment. And this would also have um, the advantage that we could add additional cells. In the beginning, I said we want to try to mimic a little bit this spinal cord situation. So where the peripheral neuron synapse onto neurons in the central nervous system, for sure, this is not just peripheral neuron on one type of spinal cord neuron. There are multiple um, spinal cord neuronal types, um, also inhibitory neurons that play a role here. So this device would give us the possibility to maybe um, make this whole system even more complex. So in the end, I want to come back to my initial question. If these human stem cell derived neuron, neurons, are they a step towards um, translational pain research? I think that these um, neurons are already a part of it. They are already used by quite a lot of research groups all over the world. Um, not at least because the protocol from Yamanaka and Takahashi made it now so easy to have access to pluripotent stem cells. And a lot of, of projects use them now also to show that what can be seen in a rodent model system can also be somehow seen in these cells or not. Um, I think it's becoming a more and more important tool to complement what's known from animal model system. And also, I think in the future, and this is also what some groups already do, is that you can use these cells also to set up screening um, model systems to test compounds, toxicity, etc on cells that are kind of derived from a human background. And with this, I want to finish. Um, so I'm working in the lab of Jan Siemens, and he has been tremendously supportive in these yeah, past years, because working with stem cells can sometimes be really difficult. And he supported that, although I'm the kind of only one working with this exotic model system. Um, and I also want to mention Claudio, who is my partner in the SFB, uh, with, which, with whom I'm now doing this co-culture system that I hope will give us very soon very exciting results. 
I thank you for your attention and yeah, I'm happy to discuss and answer questions. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, we still, um, the q and is still open, so as we are waiting for more people to write down their questions, I can start with one question here. Um, so you already mentioned that uh, the human cells that derive neurons like the one you're using are already used in pain research, but are they mostly used uh, for academic uh, research or have they been used from pharmaceutical industry already? Have they found some use for them? Do you um, know? So I think the pharmaceutical industries, they um, some of them use them as well. I mean, um, I guess, uh, especially maybe as screening systems for compounds to look at toxicity and so on. Um, I think the problem sometimes is that these differentiation procedures can be very elaborate and take time. And this might not be so handy for a pharmaceutical company. So what I heard a lot is that they reach out to basic scientists and ask if they would be willing to maybe test certain aspects and then they, they give kind of funding for that. Mm -hmm. um, because this is unfortunately, so these methods are not yet um, high throughput, you know? So, I mean, I try to, to get those cells on 96 wells, um, but you have to keep in mind until the cells reach a certain stage of maturity, they need to differentiate for four weeks, five weeks. And to keep these neurons in such a small space is really difficult. So therefore, um, yeah, I guess it's not in a wide range that this is used already. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. This, there was a question from the audience asking what questions would you like to answer using this co-culture model you, you showed us? So um, pain is sometimes also um, discussed in the context of um, changes in synaptic plasticity. So especially chronic pain. So pain where you don't know why do people have pain because there's no reason anymore. Normally, if you, if you cut yourself or so, you, you have a reason why you feel pain, but some people, and it's, it's actually a, a rather large amount of the world population, they suffer from chronic pain where they don't know why, where this is coming from. And there is this discussion that this could be due to synaptic changes, to synaptic plasticity taking place in the CNS, but also taking place already on the level of the spinal cord. And so um, with this first project where we now use this mutation um, in the NAF channel, we would like to see if this already gives us a hint that there are um, some synaptic changes going on that could explain some of the phenotypes that these patients are suffering from. Thank you very much. Maybe we can have one more question from the audience. Uh, how about a triple co-culture with glial cells? As microglia, for example, play quite a big role in neuropathic pain development. Is that possible? Yeah, that's that's a good one. And this is what I said in, in, the, begin, uh, in the end when I showed this microfluidic device. Um, yeah, I mean, there are much more cells that have an influence in pain and microglia for sure is one of them. Here, the question is, what kind of microglia would you take? So, so far we are able to have a, a system that is completely based on human cells. To differentiate microglia is um, difficult. I just tried it this year together with a student and it was not so successful. Um, so the question would be maybe to toss some mouse microglia on top and have a look, but then again, you, you come into this a little bit this conundrum that you have again, um, mouse tissue in there, um, which could behave completely different compared to the human tissue, because this is one of the ideas behind it. We would like to have this, this pure human um, system to avoid having kind of uh, an influence of another organism that might be different from the human organism. But yeah, in principle, it's, it's absolutely a good suggestion and something that uh, we would love also to pursue. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. And okay, I have more of a technical question. And how have you encountered any problems, like methodological and uh, technical problems, while uh, co-culturing the different type of neurons? Um, in what sense you mean? Because they might need different media or yeah, different in substances. that sense how would you treat that um so, when you mix them together because you i like you said you differentiate them separately but then you put them in the same dish like how yeah. is that going to begin with um we just did it and it worked um the point is that these eye clots, um they need to have some serum at some point um, and my cells don't like serum. This we know already. If they have serum, can make so many things to cells, but serum is so undefined. Um, and so I decided I just leave the serum out, and obviously it didn't harm um, the neurons. So um, this is, uh, yeah, this is just trial and error. And um, to be honest, I mean, I just said that with the microglia, we wouldn't like to have a mouth compo um, component in there. The eye clots actually need astrocytes mm. for their development. I didn't mention that. And so far, I mean, we are able to um, differentiate astrocytes from um, human pluripotent stem cells. That's, that's possible. But most of the time we use mouse astrocytes, but this is also something that changes the whole system. So we had to fiddle around a little bit because um, during the time where you induce the transcription factors um, in either the nociceptors or the glutamatergic neurons, these cells are still very plastic. So when you add them, um, the astrocytes during that time, they don't like that. So we had to kind of wait longer before we could do that. Okay. Thank you very much. And do we have any more questions from the audience? No. Uh, I think then um, we can have a short break. Thank you very much for your time. And we will be back around in 15 minutes at 4.30 for the next session uh, with Ignite Talks from newly established uh, PIs. Thank you. <laughs>